Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Views on View. This week on our panel, we have Joe Eames. Hey, everybody. I'm Charles Max Wood from devchat.tv. I just want to remind people quickly about my new show, The Dev Rev, talking about freedom, uh, developer freedom. So freedom to pursue what you want in your code, in your career, and in your life. So looking forward to getting that rolling. I'm recording the first episodes in a couple days, but they should be out well before this episode goes live. So we also have a special guest this week, and that's Alexander Lichter. Hi, folks. What's up? This episode is sponsored by Kendo UI. Kendo UI allows you to build better apps faster. They have a comprehensive library ranging from data grids and charts to buttons and sliders. Plus, you can use their components as plain JavaScript as well as in Angular, React, and Vue. They have a large collection of customizable popular themes like Bootstrap and Material. Go check them out at reactroundup.com slash kendo UI. Now, I, I am terrible at German, so I'm sure I killed your name, and I'm sorry. But <laughs> No, it's pretty good, actually. So uh, usual, usually people would, would butcher it even more. <laughs> I don't know if that makes me feel better. Anyway, do you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, I'm uh, Alexander Lichter, or in Germany, uh, German, I would say Alexander Lichter. <laughs> Lichter. Um, oh, cool. Lichter, yeah. <laughs> uh, sounds a bit weird, maybe, but... Yeah, that's my name. Uh, I'm a Next.js core team member. Also, uh, I'm doing a bit of consultancy besides my, my study. I'm currently pursuing a CS degree. And uh, yeah, I'm from Germany. Nice. So uh, yeah, there was some information about what's coming in Nuxt and uh, yeah, some other stuff that we ran across. And so we thought we'd invite you on to, uh, yeah, to talk about Nuxt and all of that good stuff. It also looks like you uh, have some stuff about like uh, server-side rendering and things like that on your blog. And so yeah, let's let's dive into all of this. But uh, to get us started, why don't you give us a little bit of an introduction to what Nuxt is for people who aren't familiar with it? Sure. So Nuxt.js is actually a framework on top of Vue.js. So um, what that means is it doesn't replace Vue.js. It's used on top, and it has several benefits. Mostly, it's used for server-side rendering. I think we'll, we'll come to this in a second. But it provides a lot of features out of the box. So, for example, it provides you already set up with Vuex, with Vue Meta to, to manage your meta tags, with Vue Router. Uh, it already gives you a Webpack config, Babel config, you're ready to go. You don't even have to configure like a single line. So that, that's like the greatest benefits. You have a lot of power, a lot of batteries included. And it will also provide you with a very good uh, SEO, definitely. Sounds good. Yeah, I, I generally see people using Nux to do like static site rendering. So not server side rendering, but they actually just to render out a, a static web page. Is that a common use case or is it more often used for server side rendering on an app that's gonna load up J uh Vue.js on the front end? So pre-rendered or statically rendered sites are definitely a use case where, where I would use Nux.js, where it's also often used because Nux.js has like three common modes. So you either has the, have the server-side rendered mode where you have a node server in the background that yeah do, does the server-side rendering for the first request. Mm -hmm. Then you have the SPI mode. That's like when you would traditionally uh, set up a normal Vue.js app in a typical SPI. And then you have the the option to generate your, your page. So like you take a snapshot of your SSR version or, um, and then you can post it on GitHub pages on Netlify and so on. Yep. Yeah, pretty pretty good use case, definitely. So I'd like to like really understand this. I've Let's say that I'm familiar with Vue. I've done some Vue and do, do your typical stuff. Why in the world would I ever want care to or want to learn Nuxt? Well, okay, Let, let's, let, let's start like this. When you use Vue, you usually have like a few things that could be maybe managed better. For example, the routing. If you have like a large application, it's, in my opinion, really hard to keep track of all the routes or to add new ones. And with Next, you have a folder or a folder structure-based routing. So this is maybe, maybe something people know from other frameworks. Or like if you have PHP experience, you can just add a file in your pages folder. And this stands for route. So if you add like an about the view file in your pages folder, this will render if you access your next application slash about, for example. So this is one also another benefit of Next. So you don't so have to. It simplifies yeah. simplifies routing. I don't have to do exactly. nearly as much configuration. Okay. So then I, I might consider using Next just because hey, it makes the the routing configuration easy. Other than that, it's. It's just like I'm doing normal Vue.js, but I'm still doing Nux because now my routing configuration is tens easier. That's actually like a valid use case. 
it is, but but Nux brings you brings you even more. So um, if you use Nux in the server side rendered mode, which or in the universal mode it's called, which is I think the most popular one. I've used this almost entirely for like the first year I've used Nux, and then I also tried out the other modes. It will boost up your SEO because what usually happens if you have a typical SPA client side rendered. You access the page, then you have like a short white flash because the browser has to download the JavaScript and then you see the contents. The same goes for the Google bot or the web crawler that's accessing your page. So the first thing you see is like a white page. Or if you're if the web crawler, I think Bing and DuckDuckGo and so on, they, they don't even pass JavaScript, so they, they don't index your site properly. With server-side rendering, what's happening is that the first request will be sent to the node server in the background, and the node server will present you the already rendered HTML. So you see something, also the users and the, the web crawlers, they see the uh, rendered HTML. The JavaScript will be downloaded anyway, and then the, the HTML will be, it's called hydrated. So all the, the async procedures, the also async components will be loaded, but the web crawler has the HTML um, already there. All right. So. That, that's probably the reason most people use Nux just to go to, for the server side rendering. But do people, you, you don't have to turn that on when using Nux, right? I could, you could just exactly. use it to get the routing benefits. Are there other cases besides routing benefits where you'd use Nux without doing server side rendering? I think the development or the developer experience we provide, so we aim to, to make development very easy and also very fast. So we provide you with, with a bit of best practices. So our folder structure for, for every project is basically the same first. You have like an assets folder where you put in your fonts, your, your uh, pre-processing files, your images, and so on. You have a static folder that's used for, for example, the fav icon or the robots.txt. You have a pages folder for the routing. You have a components folder for all the components and so on. So if you use Nuxt uh, in multiple projects, you can quickly find yourself home because you know the structure and you also know what happens. Hmm. Okay. So that, that's another point. I think the other important part is that um, you, you don't have to configure a lot. So as I said, you can start with zero configuration. If you want to add something like modules, you can use a file called nux.config.js, which is a very great abstraction of like all the things in your view app and your build process. So webpack config, barber config, and so on. And that makes also uh, development fast and life easy. So if I want to start with Nux, do I just npm install Nux and then kind of uh, new up some project, or how does that work? Yeah, good, good point. So um, Nux provides you tools called Create Nux App. You might be familiar with something like Create uh, React App, but that's kind of the same idea. So you can run npx create Rea uh, create Nux App or yarn create Nux App. And then you will have uh, a few questions, like if you want to use ESLint, if you want to use a CSS framework and so on. Uh, and then we'll completely scaffold you a basic project and you can just start. Now, what about using it for uh, static sites? Is That's pretty common, right? Yeah, that, that's also that's also um, it's also common, definitely. Not as common as SSR, of course, but yeah. Let's explain just what is a static, statically rendered site. So in, in the end, you can think of it as like a snapshot of your server on its side. You think about you hit each route or each page once and like save the HTML snapshot mm -hmm. and then do it basically like in server-side rendering. So instead of calling the server, you see the HTML and then it will uh, get hydrated. So the like, JavaScript will be loaded and so on. It, that's pretty nice because you, uh, if you don't have that ma uh, that's much dynamic data, that's, ne that's neat because you can host it without a server. You don't need Node.js behind it. You can also get GitHub pages and Netlify. The time to first byte, for example, is pretty fast because you don't have a server request. You just like download the HTML. And of course, there are some limitations. For example, if you have a lot of dynamic data, I wouldn't suggest using like a static site because then you, for example, you see first some old or outdated information that will be updated then. That's not that good. But yeah, generally static sites, for example, if you have a portfolio site, my own one, for example, is also um, used uh, or generated with, with Nux. You can easily uh, use it. And if something updates, you can run uh, the, the generate command again, and the new site will be present. So can you generate a static site and still have some interactive features in it? I mean, like, you generate a static site, and then you could be missing a lot of the little e interactive pieces, even on something like a portfolio site. Oh, so, yeah, of course. So the, the, the site won't be just HTML and no JavaScript at all. You still have view loading up and all, uh, so view router, view X, and so on. That's still there on client side. 
the, the way that I think about the difference between a statically rendered site and server side rendering is that the statically rendered site generally doesn't have a back end to it. Right, so it's not yep. calling out to an a, uh, an API that you've built in some backend right. system like Express, and you so you can do this. So there's no reason why you can't use Vue to do animations and things like that on the front end, or maybe load in something like Discuss for comments or things like that if you're building a blog or something on it. It's just yep. uh, you don't have a back end that you're maintaining for it. Whereas the server side rendering, it's hey, you know what? I'm going to speed up the load time. I'm going to make it a little bit more uh, search engine friendly. But ultimately, there's a back end there that contains some information that I need in order for the, the website to operate. Yeah, that, that comes pretty close to it. So if, if you think like you have an e-commerce site, like a shop or something, what you could do is each time, for example, you saw the product, you could like re-render, uh, like regenerate the static page with all the new information, like, okay, the stock count is now decreased and so on. Or if you have added a product, you can regenerate it. While with when you use server side rendering, it will be automatically there because you will do the API call to the backend on each on each request. Hmm. So maybe that clears it up a little. Mm -hmm. There is also a, another thing which is important because Next.js um, adds a method to to each page component. So the yeah the components on the pages directory, which is called async data. There's also a second one called fetch. They are pretty similar. And what happens is they run before the page is rendered. So if you want to do an API call because you need it for the page content, you can put it in there, like put an Axios request in there, wait it or do it with a promise. And the API will be called from, from the backend. Then in, in async data, the results will be merged with your components data. And in fetch, the view X store will be populated. And then you can use this and it's already there on the first request. So as soon as you see the content, it's already up to date. Hmm. Okay. So doesn't that, though, have making that call uh, before the page is loaded, doesn't that kind of defeat the purpose of doing the static or server-side rendered site? Um, on server-side rendering, this, this is needed because otherwise you would have the same problem that you will have like with a normal view application where the meta tags, for example, they are uh, manipulated after the JavaScript is downloaded and so on. But you don't want that. You usually want to have your meta tags already present and the content up to date. So of course, if you like do five API calls before the site is rendering, this will slow it down. So you have to find a balance there as well and just load the like needed information for the actual page uh, page rendering. But for example, if you have a, pro a profile page for user, it's completely valid to say make the API request to the backend, get the user information, put it in there. Right. Okay. Huh. I'm I'm not sure I completely follow that. So. You're, you're making a request for data after the page loads. And yeah, like Joe said, you know, it should render with all the data in it. So are you, are you talking about just some of the other aspects that aren't critical, I guess, for the reasons that you're doing this, the server-side rendering? Or Well, no, I, I think if you're doing the server-side rendering, you will hit like, uh, say, say you have a blog and you hit slash post mm -hmm. slash one. Yep. What you will see or what you will want to see also for the web crawler and for user is first of all, like the content. So like the yep. post title and the post content. To, to achieve that, you have this async data function that runs before the page is rendered and the page render will wait on that, which does the call to the API or to whatever service or grabs something from MongoDB and so on, gets the post data, merges it with the component data, and then this page view with the data up to date will be rendered as HTML. Right. And then you can subsequently do, for example, if everything is mounted, you can, can do another, uh, other calls. Or if you then navigate to another page, this won't be executed on the server anymore. This is then all client side. Right. Only the first request will actually hit the server, does the server rendering. And after that, it will behave like a normal traditional SPA. Okay. I, I think what I misunderstood was that it was happening on the server and not on the client. So. Yeah, async data is only is only executed on server side, but only for the first request because you only hit it there. Right, that makes sense. Why is it called Nuxt JS? <laughs> That's a good question. I actually can't tell you that. Um, I know Nuxt JS uh, is inspired by Next JS, and it came out just a few weeks after Next JS came out. So probably, if I, if I would have to guess, also coming a bit from there, and of course from Vue. But I can't tell you, uh, I'm, I'm not 100% certain about that. You would have to, to ask Sebastian and Alex about it. Yeah. That was the leap that I took, was they yeah. named it after Next and then just called it something else. 
So what about feature parity between Next and Next? Do you know how equivalent the two of them are? <laughs> yeah, well, um, as they're based on, on different frameworks, uh, it's hard to tell because the, the approaches are sometimes quite similar and sometimes very different. So Next.js, for example, has uh, a method called get initial props, which can be compared to an async data method. In React, what, what we'll do there is, yeah, as, as the, the, the function said, you will provide the initial props for the, for the components. What we usually do, we, of course, look around. We, we, take, uh, we, we look for good parts and other frameworks as well, because if they've done something great, why not implement it? But we also keep in mind what is useful for the Vue community, what is useful for our users. And um, that's why we, our upcoming version, 2.3, 2 will have a lot of refactoring inside. So there we will refactor uh, Next.js to a monorepo. Is, is it um, not in one repo right now? So it is in one repo, but what we do there is like we decouple the packages. So currently we have just like one monolithic code base. And what we then do is like similar, a bit, of, a bit similar to Vue 3, I think. And also the, the, current, the current state of Vue, we split it up in smaller packages. Say a builder, a generator for static mm -hmm. generated pages, a renderer, a config package, a webpack package, and so on. And the goal of this is, of course, it's a clear structure. So you know where you can find which component. Everything is decoupled, so you can also switch out part of it if you want. For example, if you say, okay, Webpack, nice, but I really want to go with Parcel or Rollup, you could simply create a, a package for that and then just plug it in, replace the Webpack pa package, and there you go. Also, contribution is, is easier because, as I said, the structure is clear and they're all decoupled. And uh, in future, we'll also have their own tests. That's the thing we're still, still working on. And then people who really want to contribute, they can touch this single package. It's completely isolated. And there you go. That makes sense. What else are you adding to Nuxt? And how does that play into sort of the vision of what you want Nuxt to be? Well, with 2.3, a huge... Developer experience, uh, developer experience update, sorry, uh, and improvement will come. So the CLI will be improved, the visual things will have uh, improvements for everything that's, that's part of building the actual application. So we still want to improve this and also um, yeah, keep, the, keep the performance and the developer experience up. Because I think the more you like building applications with Next, the, the more you will use it. And also, you will recommend that to, to your friends and colleagues. So that's an important point. It, it was always uh, a main goal to keep up the X. Then a modern mode will come. So um, what the modern mode does, it's similar to Vue CLI, and I think React has also currently implemented this. It will create another bundle. So um, you have usually just have a client bundle for a normal Vue application. For Next, you will have a client and a server bundle because the components have to get rendered to, to HTML on the server. And with modern mode, you have a, uh, we have a third bundle, which then will be delivered to Evergreen browser. So like the, the last two versions, Chrome or Firefox and so on, which will contain code that's not as much transpiled <laughs> as the, the other one. So the, the normal bundle one is transpiled to work with IE9, for example. Mm -hmm. And um, so the, the bundle size is decreased and... Um, I think that's a great improvement for, for people with, with modern browsers so they load the page even faster. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, that makes a lot of sense to me just from the standpoint of you can target, like you said, the evergreen browser. So whatever level of implementation they have for, say, ES6 kind of thing, you, you can kind of build down to the lowest common denominator of that. And then um, hopefully the browsers have optimized those operations where on, yeah, on older browsers, you have to transpile it down to ES5. And then, you know, that, that may not be as optimal because the exactly. browser didn't implement it. You had to build it out that way. I mean, transpile code is always larger because you have to, you have to, yeah, transpile it. So add, add more lines of code. Thanks God Babel is doing this and we don't have to do it manually. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's the truth. And it's, it's also, it depends on, um, on how it's transpired, but mostly it's also slower than the original implementation, of course. Mm -hmm. So how we do this is basically, um, if you're using SSR mode, you, we will just check based on the user agent, then deliver the modern or the older, the older version. But uh, on the SPA mode or on generated pages, we can't do that, of course. We don't have server behind that. So we will deliver both bundles but if the browser is supporting the, the module, the module tag, yeah, so, so the script, no, the module attribute and script tag, we will deliver the newer one. Otherwise, they're older. 
that makes sense. Yeah, and I think that that these are the these are the main features I would say for Nux 2.3. I guess when uh, this episode comes out, it will already be released. <laughs> so yeah, it's coming pretty soon. There's also some some smaller things like we have a help command now, and we also support asynchronous T in the Nux config JS. But yeah, that in compared to the to the other two things, also they're just smaller small additions. This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give you full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So, if you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. So um, let's say that somebody's learning learning view and they're um, where does Nuxt fall in the learning? Where should it fall in the learning path for Vue? Like I've decided I want to learn Vue. Where should I plan on learning Nuxt? Should I put it pretty early? Should I wait for a long time until I've written a few applications and feel comfortable with Vue? That's a good question, actually. So I think it's it's uh, it's a lot of personal preference. What I did, like I wrote a larger application for clients once with Vue. Then I switched to Nux because I discovered like how easy it is, especially from the routing point of view, from the zero improvements. I think if you don't know anything about Vue, I would start like learning the basic concepts, the life cycle, how components work, and so on and so on. But if you have a basic knowledge and understanding, I think it's pretty straightforward to get into Nux because it doesn't add that much to Vue.js except like the async data and the fetch method on page components. And you can then start gradually start to uh, like getting advanced, modifying the configurations and so on. So basically, if you have a basic understanding, I suggest to to give it a shot. Okay. What about learning resources for Next? What are good learning resources for people that want to learn Next? Yeah, good good point. So first of all, the documentation. Uh, I'm I'm trying to improve them actually every day. So. Uh, I suggest first reading them. You, you find a lot there. By the way, if there are any problems, just open up an issue, open up a pull request uh, if you want to add something there. There is a lot of user, uh, user-generated user content. So there are a lot of blog posts. Uh, i also written a few of them, for example, about server-side rendered caveats, so which problems could happen when you come from Vue. Go to Nuxt and say, oh, my app is breaking now. What, why? What happened? So that's the thing. Then you have yeah a lot of uh, medium posts then you have a few paid courses as well so there are a lot of like say a few days before there there was a release from from viewschool.io for example and i know there's also a, another nice next course going on that's uh that's one from eric if i'm right yeah eric also is course. one of the hosts of the show and yeah. I'll put a link in the show notes so you can check it out so I've uh, I've worked, for example, uh, with with U School on their their notes, uh, and I know Alex and and Sebastian are also working uh, with few people on on uh, nice videos. So definitely worth checking out. Cool, cool. What about uh, are there a lot of companies right now, or any companies that you know of that are using Next for any big sites? Well, um, as I'm like every day in the Next Discord and helping people out if if they have problems. I know a few larger pages that uh, that actually use Next. One one larger company. It's called Alibaba. Uh, not the mm-hmm. not the fa- very very famous Alibaba. It's uh, Alibaba Aero. That's uh, a flight company. They've switched to Next, and one of our call team members uh, helped them uh, to transition to Next. And they have a large amount of of daily users. Also, I know um, a British telecommunication company with fifth, uh, not 50, 25k daily users, but don't uh, don't pin me on the numbers. They switched to Nuxt as well because they see the, the zero improvements. 
The problem is most companies who use Vue or most larger ones, for example, say GitLab, 9gag, and so on, um, they use it on top of, say, Rails, for example, mm -hmm. or a, a custom framework. And it's hard to integrate Nux, which, which comes with the, the approach to say, for example, in the service at rendered mode, you only have the Vue framework. It's hard to incorporate that in your current, say, Rails, Laravel, Django, whatever. So that, that could be difficult. Yeah, I, I can see that. A lot of the server-side rendering stuff, I mean, mm. even for more mature communities like React, I mean, it, it's still not perfect on, on things like That's Rails true. and things like that. So, you know, it works great if you're using it in kind of the, the use case that the maintainers built it in. But yeah, you, you move off to something that's not JavaScript and it gets kind of dicey. Yeah, exactly. Especially like I, I used Vue when I when I was a lot into backend development before. I uh, used Vue together with Laravel, and I, because of Laravel, I came basically uh, to to Vue. And if you just use Vue to improve or enhance a single page that is actually rendered on the server through PHP, then then you can't really integrate uh, can't really integrate Nux there because it it is already server side rendered. So yeah, right. yeah. One of my neighbors is really into Laravel and. I give him crap over that, but the Laravel community has really embraced Vue. I give him less crap, about, less crap about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I still use use Laravel for for larger applications to to build an API because I I come from the PHP community, but I started using Express, for example, for for smaller applications. Also, that's also a fun fun thing inside Next.js, so you can use Express inside Nuxt. And this, this works pretty well. For example, if you just have a form and you want to send an email, then you usually don't want to spin up an external API for that or, or something to, to validate the form, send out the email, so you can do that inside Nuxt as well. Hmm. So yeah, basically a, a lot of possibilities, a lot of opportunities, but um, as, as Nuxt grew into a very versatile framework that it's not only now well known for server-side rendering applications, and that's not the only use case. It's pretty hard to like sum it up and bring it uh, in in like five sentences. <laughs> so that's the thing uh, I already noticed when I when I gave like introduction to talks into Nux. That's always hard. Right. So so when does this next version of Nux drop? I'm not sure about the the exact date, but yeah, as I said, the, if the episode comes out or when the episode comes out, it will be out, I guess. So. Give it a week or two. Yeah. So we're talking about it coming out in the future. But look, guys, it's done. <laughs> <laughs> Download it now. <laughs> use it. Use it. Yeah. And I, I must admit, um, like I've used Nuxt.js for I think the last, or basically all my all my last view projects besides the uh, after the one I built just with you and noticed that SEO is a problem and routing is tedious and. Since then, like I said, I use it for, for SPAs, for static generated applications. I did not use Vue CLI 3 by, by now, except for just playing around, because the, the Nux scaffolding is so powerful and you have basically everything that you need. And if not, there is a module for that. So yeah, Nux has basically also own modules you can include that can completely modify the, the framework's behavior as there are, there are hooks and specific mm -hmm. steps the framework does, like build step if you want to add assets or before rendering a route if you want to add something due to context, something like this. So I, I try to embrace the power there and it works pretty well. And also there is no, no view CLI in Nuxt integration by now. There's but, not? No, there's not. There's not. Gotcha. So th there were plans, the, but they, they got discarded to, to build Nuxt on top of view CLI. But as the projects also from, from the code base and also sometimes uh, from, from the, the ideas drifted a little bit apart, yeah, the plans were discarded. But uh, we are always in contact uh, with, with Guillaume and talking about how this might be possible also to, to make the transition easier. But who knows, maybe, maybe next UI will be a thing in the future. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Let's see. So we have a lot of ideas and... Um, so the future versions won't be boring. That's, that's also a fact. <laughs> so one thing I want to ask you about, uh, just kind of on the, the personal side of things, is before the show, you mentioned that you're a student, that you're doing an internship. Um, yes. I mean, looking at you, you look pretty young. Um, and you're on the core team of, of a project used by a lot of people. And I guess what I'm wondering is, you know, how does somebody at your stage of life wind up getting involved in a project like Nuxt? 
Yeah, good question. So yeah, I'm, I'm basically 21. <laughs> and yeah, how, how, I, how I became a core team member, I think it, it all started when I used it and I, I realized, okay, there was an example with uh, Tailwind CSS. It's a CSS framework I, I mostly use. And there was, a, I think, just a small mistake or they forgot to add something. And I created a pull request, got accepted. And then I started to dig into the code base because I, I thought about, okay, this, this project is quite interesting. I want to, to learn more. So I did this. I, I dug into that. I created like first small modules. Then I got an invite uh, to, the, to the Nuxt community organization. There are like people in there yeah, who write Nuxt modules who want to maintain them. And then I started contributing bug fixes and feature ideas and got uh, in touch with, with the other core team members. And yeah, that was like July or something, and end of June, so beginning of July, something like this. And yeah, since then I just contributed and uh, tried a few issues, helped people. Then there was the View London conference uh, in September. And there I met uh, Sebastian and Alex, the, the founders of Nax, the Chopin brothers first time in uh, in real life and they said yeah you know what congratulations you're on the slide you're on the core team i was like what really awesome so nice to to sum it up basically it's just the the eagerness to learn and to dig into the code and i i really appreciate it if people ask me oh why why does this and this happen or why is it used that way because they are like they, they look interested and uh, they want to dig deeper and i want to help them with that and yeah, just contribute, share your opinion, help help other people, basically, and be be nice. <laughs> yeah, I think I think the thing that I want to just highlight is that you know you're not old enough to have thirty zillion years of experience like Joe does, and you can still go and contribute to bazillion, uh, bazillion. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think that's the technical term, Joe. Yes. So uh, yeah, you know you don't have to have a bazillion or thirty bazillion years of experience to go contribute to open source. I mean, you just got involved. You know, you started solving some problems and then they kind of said, hey, you're on the core team now. And, you know, and that was it. Yeah. So it it doesn't matter how old you are, or how much experience you have. In the end, because even even though I'm on the core team, I'm still learning new things. It's not like I know the complete code base. And even every time I see like a new PR popping up from another team member, I look through and just think like, wow, great idea or great implementation. So it's not like... I don't know everything about the framework. I would say I know it pretty well, but we're all still learning. And that that's also a thing. We want to share our experience in there. And even if you, as you said, if you don't have uh, experience that much, but you're into it, go for it. Every contribution matters. So to the documentation, to the ecosystem, to the core, every, even, even if it's just a typo fix, read the documentation and say, oh, damn, he did a typo there. Let's fix this. That, that helps a lot. Awesome. Yeah, I'm really happy. <laughs> <laughs> So what's next for you or what's next for you? <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> that was terrible. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I apologize to everyone. There. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty obvious. Uh, um, good question. So I'm, I'm in Dublin at the moment. I'm here till March. Now I go back to Germany and continue studying. So that means, I guess, uh, more time for, for next development as well. <laughs> because if you have a full-time job, it's still a bit tricky. I gave a talk at the meetup in Dublin soon, like end of the month. So when the episode is out, it will basically be over already about next. And I'll try to yeah, continue speaking at some local groups or maybe also some smaller conferences. I guess I'll go to Vue.js Amsterdam as well. Yeah, and I just try to, to keep it up, I think. <laughs> awesome. Well, that's everything I had to ask Chuck. Yeah, I asked him all my hard questions and he asked, answered them without it. Uh, taking a breath, so um, <laughs> I try my best. So, if people want to find you online, where do they go? Yeah, so uh, I'm somewhat active on Twitter, so I read a lot. I don't tweet a lot, except answering for questions, posting out hot knocks JS tips. <laughs> so it's the Alex Lichter, L I C H T R. On GitHub, it's uh, my nickname I have everywhere else, except for Twitter because uh, I joined it late. It's Manny L M A N N I L, capital L, but I think it doesn't matter. Yeah, I have a blog at blog.lictor.io or nax.xyz, hot domain. <laughs> yeah, otherwise, uh, if you have questions uh, regarding Nax, usually the easiest way to get them solved is join Discord, just chat with us because um, core team members are pretty active and want to help you if you have uh, problems. So yeah, I think that's, that's a good way of finding me and asking me some stuff. 
Nice. And don't feel bad about being inactive on Twitter because everybody knows that uh, Twitter is really only good for complaining about American politics. So, <laughs> Oh, yeah, um, it is. Right. <laughs> yeah. I still have uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, such tweets in the timeline, though I don't follow that many, that many American people. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. This episode is brought to you by TripleByte. Applying to programming jobs sucks. You have to put the right keywords in your resume. You spend hours and hours on the phone screens and take home projects. And that's assuming the company even responds to your application. Well, if you're a software engineer, TripleByte can help. They work with over 400 top tech companies from big names like Dropbox and Adobe to exciting startups. You do one brief online interview with them. And if you do well, you go straight to final interviews with the company on their platform. It's like the common app for software developers. TripleByte does not look at your resume or where you went to school. All they care about is if you can code. I've helped dozens of software developers with various credentials get jobs, and this looks like a terrific way for you to get in and get interviewed and get a job without a lot of the hassle and overhead. You can go check them out at triplebyte.com slash view. That's triplebyte.com, byte as in eight bits. As a special offer for listeners of this show, if you take a job through TripleByte, they'll offer you a $1,000 signing bonus. All right. Well, let's go ahead and do some picks. Uh, Joe, yeah, do you have some picks? Yeah. Yes, I do. I have all kinds of picks. There's so, so many picks. You wouldn't even believe the number of picks that I've got. <laughs> um, I recently signed up for the View School I.O. They have this little discount. It's probably going to be over by the time this uh, episode airs. But uh, still, I would recommend that. They seem to have quite a bit of content uh, available on their site. So for learning View and Next. That's definitely a place to check out. So I'll be one of my picks. Another pick is uh, one of my good friends, Dave Geddes, makes these amazing tutorials on a bunch of different subjects. Uh, he does one called um, Grid Critters, which is about learning CSS grids, and then Flex Zombies for learning Flexbox. And then he's just launched his most recent project in conjunction with the Google, uh, some group at Google, Google Developer group, I, not the Google Developer Group, I can't remember what the name of it is, but um, Chrome Developer Group. And it's called uh, Service Workies, and it's System for Learning Service Workers. And it's pretty cool, but he's just got the preview out right now. Hopefully by the time this episode releases, then the whole thing will actually be um, out. So I would definitely check that out. Go look for Service Workies, and uh, hopefully it's released by then. Nice. Yeah, Dave's a terrific guy. and. Uh... His stuff is so creative. I love it. Yeah, and the artwork and the music are super cool. So definitely worth uh, checking out. Yeah, I guess I'll have to check it out as well because my service worker knowledge sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I did an interview with, um, and I'm blanking on his name off the top of my head, Aaron Gustafson from Microsoft. And we talked about progressive web apps. And yeah, the core of, of what he was talking about was service workers. And so if you're, if you're looking at some of that stuff, it's, it's definitely interesting to dive into. I'm going to go ahead and uh, throw out some picks as well. So one thing that I've been playing with on my phone, and I, I kind of check it every few hours and, and play it a little bit, is uh, Disney Heroes Battle Mode. Uh, my kids really like sitting down and, and playing it with me. So uh, I'm going to pick that because I'm really, really enjoying it. And then another thing that I'm going to pick is a book that I'm reading with my kids. It's called The Immortal Nicholas by Glenn Beck. And uh, it's just a terrific story. It's kind of an... Well, it kind of... No, it's not kind of. It's an origin story for Santa Claus. It's very uh, Christian and Christ focused. And it's just a terrific, terrific story. Um, and so I've been reading that to my kids heading into the holiday season as we're recording this. This episode will probably come out right around Christmas. Um, so maybe, you know, put it on your list for next year. But uh, really, really enjoying that. Yeah, that, those are my picks. Alexander, do you have some picks for us? Sure, sure. So the first one, it's absolutely not uh, related to development at all, but I guess Chris would like it. It's called uh, Brain Arrows. Uh, it's a website and there are a few experiments that show how biased our brains actually are and how uh, that, that, so that we are barely aware of that. So um, a few studies and a few questions, you get then uh, into, into like a group, group A or B, depending on the question, and you have to answer them. And uh, there were like a few interesting things. Like um, one, one question was, what do you think at which age died Mahatma Gandhi? So that was the basic content. But the question was posed in two different ways. So do you think he died at the age of nine or older? Or do you think he died at the age of, say, 76 or younger? Or, oh, sorry, or, or, or another age? And people completely 
guess it's it's wrong. So they they said a lower age when the age nine was included in the question than the the higher age. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so some some interesting uh, brain uh, experiments from from actual studies and actual, actual psychologists. Then my second pick is uh, is an NPM package. It's called Concerta. It's made by uh, the Nux team, but mostly by Puya, our Nux uh, core contributor. Shout outs to you. It's basically a fancy logger for like a console replacement. It also wraps console and uh, STD out and so on. We use it at Nux, but it's also used in other open source projects. And it, I use it personally for all my, my private ones because you have the information at first glance. Um, you can mock it pretty well. So that's a nice addition for that. And my last pick is an article uh, about Nux deployment because I like every third question I get is how to deploy Nux properly on XYZ. We have a few things covered in the docs, but um, especially about zero downtime deployment, there isn't much to say there. So I will link an article from Xander uh, Xander Luciano. I hope I didn't butcher that name. Who wrote up how to do zero de- uh, downtime deployment with Nux and PM2? Yeah, those are my free picks. Awesome. Well, I don't think we have anything else. So thank you for coming and talking to us about Nux. Yeah. Thanks for the invite. I really enjoyed it. All right, folks. We will be back at it next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.